Hello, and welcome to The Bard's Truth with your host, The Green Bard. This is episode 5.1 of The Dire Wolves of Winterfell, Shaggy Dog and Baby Rickon. This episode will discuss Shaggy Dog and Rickon's warg bond in A Game of Thrones. Like Rob, Rickon has no POV chapters, so we'll have to extrapolate on their bond from other POVs, chiefly Bran. A few notes. In part three, I introduced a hypothesis that the color of the direwolf's eyes might correspond to some of the direwolves having stronger telepathic genes. The red-eyed and the green-eyed children of the forest are much more powerful than their yellow-eyed brethren. I do wonder if the same holds true for direwolves. If that is the case, I have a concern that Rickon's personality may be overwhelmed by shaggy dogs, especially considering how little chance he's had to grow to be part of human society and how he has no mentor like Bran does. We'll keep this concern in the back of our minds during this analysis. In A Game of Thrones, we see a lot of contrast between Shaggy Dog and Rickon's behavior versus what we saw of Bran and Summer. While Bran and Summer are thoughtful and careful, Shaggy Dog and Rickon are aggressive. They act out violently, owing mainly to Rickon's growing anger and sadness over being abandoned by his parents and the rest of his family. It heightens to such an extent that wildness becomes a theme in Shaggy Dog and Rickon's relationship. Over and over, baby Rickon not even a fully formed human, is ignored by Catelyn, Rob, Lewin, Roderick, and even Bran. Under this backdrop, we'll investigate the development of Shaggy Dogs and Rickon's Warg bond. The themes from our prior volumes continue here as well, including personality and mood mirroring, obedience versus independence, shadowing slash protecting slash fear of the wolves, and the related wolves' innate ability to sense threats. Belonging to the pack, the instinct to hunt, being affectionate when they're together, and bad things happening when they're separated. A Game of Thrones, Bran 2. The first mention of Shaggy Dog in this volume is his name. One can't learn much about their bond from this, but certainly it is a childish name, indicative of Rickon's age and maturity, as Bran points out. He was still trying to decide on a name. Rob was calling his Grey Wind because he ran so fast. Sansa had named hers Lady, and Arya named hers after some old witch queen in the songs. And little Rickon called his Shaggy Dog, which Bran thought was a pretty stupid name for a direwolf. John's wolf, the white one, was Ghost. A Game of Thrones, Catelyn 3 The second mention of Shaggy Dog is when he is howling in the yard with his brothers. Pack behavior. It is again without Rickon, so we don't get much indication of their bond. However, we learn from Rob in the same chapter that Rickon follows him around all the time, crying, and Rob is quite sick of it, wanting Catelyn to step up. From that, it's hard not to guess that Shaggy would be spending a lot of time around Grey Wind. That said, from the passage below, it appears that Shaggy is the second wolf to howl, after Summer, the wolf further away. Shaggy is also the one belonging to Rickon, who is isolated from his family at this time due to his mother's negligence. This is a potential instance of mirroring. Rickon and Shaggy Dog feel the forlorn summer's pain, and Shaggy readily joins him howling. Grey Wind, closer, joins last, which means Shaggy is not being led by Grey Wind in this scene. It makes sense that Grey Wind is the closest, since he would be awaiting Rob coming out of the tower. Rickon needs you, Rob said sharply. He's only three. He doesn't understand what's happening. He thinks everyone has deserted him. So he follows me around all day, clutching my leg and crying. I don't know what to do with him. He paused a moment, chewing on his lower lip the way he'd done when he was little. Mother, I need you too. I'm trying, but I can't. I can't do it all by myself. Later that chapter. Outside the tower, a wolf began to howl. Caitlin trembled, just for a second. Brands. Rob opened the window and let the night air into the stuffy tower room. The howling grew louder. It was a cold and lonely sound, full of melancholy and despair. Don't, she told him. Bran needs to stay warm. He needs to hear them sing, Rob said. Somewhere out in Winterfell, a second wolf began to howl in chorus with the first. Then a third, closer. Shaggy Dong and Grey Wind, Rob said, and their voices rose and fell together. You can tell them apart if you listen close. 
A Game of Thrones, Bran 4. In Bran's first chapter after waking from the coma, we finally get our first instance of Shaggy and Rickon together. Rickon appears to be playing with Shaggy, Grey Wind, and Summer. Shaggy is clearly taking the role of Rickon's protector in the game, shadowing the boy. As to Rickon, we see him being a boy, happy for the attention of the wolves. Clearly he is very comfortable around them, indicating that his bond with Shaggy is already starting to develop. Still, no people, especially adults, are giving the boy any attention. He is isolated from Bran, his mother is gone, and Rob is uninterested, acting the Lord. Bran watched from his window seat. Wherever the boy went, Greywind was there first, loping ahead to cut him off, until Rickon saw him, screaming in delight, and went pelting off in another direction. Shaggy Dog ran at his heels, spinning and snapping if the other wolves came too close. His fur had darkened until it was all black. His eyes were green fire. Bran's summer came last. He was silver in smoke, with eyes of yellow gold that saw all there was to see. Smaller than Grey Wind and more wary, Bran thought he was the smartest of the litter. He could hear his brother's breathless laughter as Rickon dashed across the hard-packed earth on little baby legs. Later that chapter, the wolves attack Tyrion. It starts when Rickon lets them into the audience hall. Why did he do this? Did he see Summer wanting to go into the hall, as I had guessed in Part 4, opening the door out of curiosity? Or was he upset that he had again been neglected, left alone out in the yard with the wolves while the maester and his brothers were in the hall? Either way, it's clear that this theme of Rickon being left alone to fend for himself continues. Shaggy's pack behavior in the attack is noteworthy in that he is the one that sneaks up behind Tyrion. Is this an indication that he is smarter or has better instincts than his brothers? Perhaps. Later, he is the last wolf to break off the attack, and Rickon is the last to call him off. This seems to be obvious mirroring. Rickon's growing anger at his abandonment is reflected in his wolf. His eyes are burning. The wolf is angry. It ends with Rickon calling him off, but the wolf doesn't obey immediately. Similar to Summer and unlike Grey Wind. Rickon is not dominating the wolf, and they both probably have an independent streak, like I established with Summer and Bran. They do have affection for each other, though, given how Rickon warmly hugs Shaggy, probably his only friend at this point, after the incident. The door to the yard flew open. Sudden light came streaming across the hall as Rickon burst in, breathless. The dire wolves were with him. The boys stopped by the door, wide-eyed, but the wolves came on. Their eyes found Lannister, or perhaps they caught his scent. Summer began to growl first. Grey Wind picked it up. They padded toward the little man, one from the right and one from the left. The wolves do not like your smell, Lannister, the angry Joy commented. Perhaps it's time I took my leave, Tyrion said. He took a step backward, and Shaggy Dog came out of the shadows behind him, snarling. Lannister recoiled, and Summer lunged at him from the other side. He reeled away, unsteady on his feet, and Grey Wind snapped at his arm, teeth ripping at his sleeve and tearing loose a scrap of cloth. No, Bran shouted from the high seat as Lannister men reached for their steel. The dire wolf heard the voice, glanced at Bran, and again at Lannister. He crept backwards, away from the little man, and settled down below Bran's dangling feet. Rob had been holding his breath. He let it out with a sigh and called, Grey Wind! His dire wolf moved to him, swift and silent. Now there was only Shaggy Dog, rumbling at the small man, his eyes burning like green fire. Rickon, call him! Bran shouted to his baby brother, and Rickon remembered himself and screamed, Home, Shaggy! Home now! The black wolf gave Lannister one final snarl and bounded off to Rickon, who hugged him tightly around the neck. We get one more scene to close the chapter in the dining hall later that night. Grey Wind and Shaggy are fighting over a bone. Again, this is a possible indication of lingering anger in Rickon mirrored in Shaggy. Note that Rickon is not even mentioned. Either he's not there or he's being ignored even by Bran. Or maybe he's just being ignored by our author. The Lord's seat at the head of the table had been left empty, but Rob sat to the right of it, with Bran across from him. They ate suckling pig that night, and pigeon pie, and turnips soaking in butter, and afterward the cook had promised honeycombs. Summer snatched table scraps from Bran's hand, while Grey Wind and Shaggy Dog fought over a bone in the corner. Winterfell's dogs would not come near the hall now. Bran had found that strange at first, but he was growing used to it. A Game of Thrones Bran 6. Two chapters later, the anger that I was suggesting explodes onto the page, predicated by the news that Rob is marching south. This is a clear example of protecting 
mirroring the savagery of the wolf and a new theme, the wildness of both Shaggy and Rickon. One must recall that dire wolves are wild beasts, not normally domesticated, save by wargs. So this wildness is innate to Shaggy, and our warg in this case is a four-year-old boy who probably doesn't even understand the meaning of the word control. In this context, it is no surprise what happens. At this point, we must recall our hypothesis that Shaggy Dog is exceptional in comparison to the golden-eyed dire wolves, summer and gray wind in this instance. Add to this the worry that Jojen had in a storm of swords about Bran living all his days as summer. Recall from part four the coincidental wolf dreams where Bran's thoughts are overwhelmed frequently by summer's wolfish thoughts. Similarly, in our current scene, Rickon is acting wildly once he is found in the crypts. I'd suggest that Rickon's wild behavior is an example of him mirroring Shaggy's wildness, even as Shaggy is mirroring Rickon's anger. In other words, Rickon's anger is felt closely by Shaggy, while Shaggy's wild, wolfish thoughts are rubbing off on, dare I say dominating, young Rickon. As their bond develops into a full, warging experience, I worry about Shaggy's potential to further dominate the young, underdeveloped Rickon. One other thing I notice is how Rob and Grey Wind were able to dominate Shaggy to bring him to heal. Unfortunately, Rob, the leader and source of control, dare I say training, is going to be missing from Rickon and Shaggy's story hereafter. The passage culminates with the cruelty of isolating the wolf from the boy, denying him the ability for affection. This can only compound his existing feelings of anger, loneliness, and abandonment. The fact that the adults think this is a good idea is just another indication of the reality of Rickon's abandonment. His baby brother had been wild as a winter storm since he learned Rob was riding off to war. Weeping and angry by turns, he'd refused to eat, cried and screamed for most of the night, even punched old Nan when she tried to sing him to sleep, and the next day he'd vanished. Rob had set half the castle searching for him, and when at last they'd found him down in the crypts, Rickon had slashed at them with a rusty iron sword he'd snatched from a dead king's hand, and Shaggy Dog had come slavering out of the darkness like a green-eyed demon. The wolf was near as wild as Rickon, He'd bitten Gage on the arm and torn a chunk of flesh from Micken's thigh. It had taken Rob himself and Grey Wind to bring him to bay. Farlin had the black wolf chained up in the kennels now, and Rickon cried all the more for being without him. The following passage is another example of pack behavior, and one of our first clues about the magic of the wolves. They somehow sensed that their sister was coming. Shaggy, in this case, is framed as following his brothers which could be interpreted as mirroring Rickon's own penchant for following, given that he's the youngest. Bran felt all cold inside. She lost her wolf, he said, weakly, remembering the day when four of his father's guardsmen had returned from the south with ladies' bones. Summer and Grey Wind and Shaggy Dog had begun to howl before they crossed the drawbridge, in voices drawn and desolate. Beneath the shadow of the first keep was an ancient lichyard, its headstones spotted with pale lichen, where the old kings of winter had laid their faithful servants. It was there that they buried Lady, all her brothers stalked between the graves like restless shadows. She had gone south, and only her bones had returned. A Game of Thrones, Bran 7 The final chapter of Shaggy's story in A Game of Thrones again takes Rickon and Bran to the crypts. This time they're hiding there because of the dream Bran and Rickon shared about Ned's death. The chapter is also dense with our dire wolf themes. This chapter is where we realize that Rickon may share the same type of power as Bran. First, though, we see how Rickon's anger is continuing unabated. Shaggy again attacks unwitting men, this time Lewin. The attack is savage, violent, and swift, using the element of surprise. This element may be an indication of Shaggy's intelligence. Notice how he selected Lewin the man who ought to be doing a much better job of caring for Rickon. Does Shaggy know this? Is this victim selection an example of mirroring? Rickon directs harsh words at Lewin as well. With Grey Wind gone south, it takes Summer to force Shaggy to let go of Lewin, but it takes Rickon to call Shaggy off and end the wolves' ensuing fight. Fortunately, the boy calls him off quickly, and he readily obeys. The darkness sprang at him, snarling. Bran saw eyes like green fire, a flash of teeth, fur as black as the pit around them. Maester Lewin yelled and threw up his hands. The torch went flying from his fingers. 
caromed off the stone face of Brandon Stark and tumbled to the statue's feet, the flames licking up his legs. In the drunken, shifting torchlight, they saw Lewin struggling with the direwolf, beating at his muzzle with one hand while the jaws closed on the other. Summer! Bran screamed, and Summer came, shooting from the dimness behind them, a leaping shadow. He slammed into Shaggy Dog and knocked him back, and the two dire wolves rolled over and over in a tangle of gray and black fur, snapping and biting at each other, while Maester Lewin struggled to his knees, his arm torn and bloody. Asha propped Bran up against Lord Rickard's stone wolf as she hurried to assist the maester. In the light of the guttering torch, shadow wolves twenty feet tall fought on the wall and roof. Shaggy, a small voice called. When Bran looked up, his little brother was standing in the mouth of Father's tomb. With one final snap at Summer's face, Shaggy Dog broke off and bounded to Rickon's side. You let my father be, Rickon warned Lewin. You let him be. The injured Lewin immediately complains that Shaggy should be tied up in the kennels. Lewin's resistance to understanding the magic of the wolves caused friction in Bran's development as a warg. Now we see it injuring Rickon's ability to heal from his abandonment issues. This is in the face of clear evidence of the supernatural with the boys here in the dream in this chapter. That said, he definitely recognizes the wildness of Shaggy. How can he not? He's bleeding badly, and so are Summer and Shaggy. Something must be done about the behavior, no question. Yet, it is said that while Lewin ponders euthanizing his closest companion, Rickon is again forgotten amid the concerns about the violence. If only Lewin could shrug off his maester training to ignore the supernatural and instead approach these wolves and their bonds to the wargs with an open mind. If that had happened, many bad things could have been averted. Recall our theme of bad things happening when the children are separated from the wolves. Unfortunately, this whole incident is partly the result of Shaggy being tied up after the last incident. The boy needed his wolf and he needed attention to be cared for. The last small mention of Shaggy in the passage illustrates it perfectly. Rickon, given a normal amount of attention from his brother, is perfectly fine doing what he's told, as long as Shaggy can come along. Bran had never seen Maester Lewin look so uncertain before. Blood dripped down his arm where Shaggy Dog had shredded the wool of his sleeve and the flesh beneath. Asha, the torch, he said, biting through his pain. And she snatched it up before it went out. Soot stains blackened both legs of his uncle's likeness. That, that beast, Lewin went on, is supposed to be chained up in the kennels. Rickon patted Shaggy Dog's muzzle, damp with blood. I let him loose. He doesn't like chains. He licked at his fingers. Wow, I just noticed that Rickon was licking the blood off his own fingers. That is wild. You can wait with me, Bran said. We will wait together, you and me and our wolves. Both of the dire wolves were licking wounds now and would bear close watching. Bran, the maester said firmly, I know you mean well, but Shaggy Dog is too wild to run loose. I'm the third man he's savaged. Give him the freedom of the castle, and it's only a question of time before he kills someone. The truth is hard, but the wolf has to be chained, or, he hesitated, or killed, Bran thought, but what he said was, he was not made for chains. We will wait in your tower, all of us. Later in the chapter. Will you come, Rickon? His brother nodded. If Shaggy comes too, he said, running after Asha and Bran, and there was nothing Maester Lewin could do but follow keeping a wary eye on the wolves. It's so heartbreaking that the boy's only demand is to be allowed to remain in the presence of his wolf, and it's too bad that Lewin couldn't recognize that the behavior was mirroring of Rickon's own state of mind. At the tail end of the chapter, while Lewin is bandaging himself, we see one more indication of the dire wolf's telepathic abilities and connection to each other. The raven, with news of Ned's death, arrives. But before it comes in the window and lands, Summer and Shaggy Dog start howling, obviously sensing through the bond that the news that is coming is dire. Checking against our hypothesis that Shaggy is more powerful because of his green eyes, there is nothing to see here. Summer howls first, not Shaggy. That said, there are any number of reasons that Summer howled first, which are related to Bran and Summer, namely his connection to the Three-Eyed Crow. So we won't abandon the hypothesis yet. Summer began to howl. Maester Lewin broke off, startled. When Shaggy Dog bounded to his feet and added his voice to his brother's, Dread clutched at Bran's heart. It's coming, he whispered, with the certainty of despair. He had known it since last night, he realized. 
Since the crow had led him down into the crypts to say farewell, he had known it, but he had not believed. He had wanted Maester Luin to be right. The crow, he thought, the three-eyed crow. The howling stopped as suddenly as it had begun. Summer padded across the tower floor to Shaggy Dog and began to lick at the mat of bloody fur on his brother's neck. From the window came a flutter of wings. Two more points. The pack behavior, Shaggy is actually mirroring Summer. And then later on, Summer licks Shaggy Dog, which is obviously consolation and mirroring of Bran's own consolation of Rickon. So we've seen in this volume how Rickon's anger over being abandoned combines with Shaggy's innate wildness to form the basis for their bond. Like with their siblings, our other direwolf themes also abound with Shaggy and Rickon. We now look for how these themes develop into the next volume, A Clash of Kings. See you next time! Thanks to all the terrific artists who let me use their work on this YouTube video. Thanks especially to those in my family who helped in this series so far. If you enjoy this content, you can also consider supporting us on Patreon.